and a copy of this thank you and a copy of this recording will be posted on CARB's low carbon transportation webpage in the next few weeks. Uh, the presentation is not terribly long, and I think it's best to let me run through all the slides. We can answer questions and comments at the end. Uh, there will be my contact information at the end. If you have additional questions and comments after this meeting, uh, you can contact me via email and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. Uh, we also appreciate your patience if we run into tech, any technological glitches. Okay, Eloy, slide number two. That's a quick rundown of what we'd like to cover today. Uh, first, an overview of the core program. Uh, while uh, when we discuss professional landscaping and the core pro portion of the core program, we will cover previous work groups and feedback from and highlights uh, and comments. I will then talk about the draft implementation manual or we're calling it attachment D highlights. Uh, we posted this back, uh, this document back on um, August 19th and I hope you've all had time to review it and uh, are ready for some comments today. As part of the draft implementation manual, we'll also discuss the voucher amounts and the eligible equipment categories. Uh, Jacob from CalStart will then review the basics of how to participate, and then we'll review the next steps. Slide number three. Uh, now a little overview of CORE. Uh, I know this is the third work group uh, for this group, but we do have new participants. I want to get them up to speed on where we, so we all understand CORE and we're on the same page. CORE is intended to accelerate the deployment of advanced zero emission technology in the off-road sector by providing a streamlined way for fleets to access funding, which will help offset the incremental costs of such, about such technology. Core targets commercial ready products, which have not yet achieved a significant market foothold. This program allows stacking, which means you can use funding from this program and other incentive programs, but still need to follow the incentive rules for each. Also, Core does not require scrappage of one of your current pieces of equipment to get incentives for a zero emission piece of equipment. This is a first come first serve program. Um, it's maintain, uh, maintain the program for which is user friendly and a simple voucher process. Originally core was freight related equipment only. Uh, currently core has expanded vouchers into larger off-road equipment such as yard trucks and forklifts and zero emission construction and agricultural equipment. SB 170 specifies funding for small businesses or sole proprietors providing landscape equipment services. And that's what we're here, we're here for today to discuss. And that's all stems from SB 170, which provides uh, $30 million for CARB to utilize an existing program to provide incentives. Slide number four. Um, we've received a lot of feedback concerning the state small business definition, stating that 100 employees or less and the average gross income of a threshold of $15 million. Uh, many thought the definition did not meet the spirit of SB 170, helping to the really small landscapers. We went back and found a definition for micro businesses, which is 25 employees or less, and the average gross income of $5 million. Uh, sole proprietor is also using SB 170 language, and we've included that definition in the implementation manual also. There's also been a lot of discussion on funding limits and how much we should fund and specific equipment types. We'll discuss that also. We wanted to make participation in the program as easy and quick as possible, but still meet the requirement and assurances that the company is a small business and provide professional landscape services uh, just by requiring some idea. And we'll touch on this uh, a little bit further later. Also funding for the smallest landscapers. How can we help these businesses? I think we came up with a good plan. And stacking, we also wanna talk a little bit more about stacking. And we touched on this earlier. If you're not aware of this term, it's ability to use funds for multiple incentive funding sources to incentivize your zero emission offer equipment purchase. Uh, the core team has worked with the CARB Moyer team and other local air districts to find the best way to stack core with Moyer funds. Okay, slide number five. Okay, let's talk about how we think we have some solutions to the feedback and the comments. In the draft IM, we're proposing to set aside uh, some funds for micro businesses only. A set aside of $10 million for the first 180 calendar days. This will provide an opportunity for the smallest landscape businesses to take advantage of this funding. If the set aside is not used within 180 calendar days, the remaining funds will go to the rest of the eligible small businesses. 
if a set aside is, set aside is oversubscribed, all voucher requests in excess of $10 million will have access to the remaining funds. If during the first 180 days, the small business set aside is oversubscribed, vouchers will be placed on a contingency list until a cap is lifted. Uh, there's no guarantee funding will be available. The equipment and battery incentive amount will be based on a 70% of the MSRP cost. We'll be able to provide up to $25,000 per eligible purchaser. This includes batteries. We'll also require a manufacturer to have a two-year commercial warranty that covers the tool, the battery, and the charger. Um, also documentation will, will have a re requirement of a, either a California driver's license or California ID, along with either a C27 landscape contractor's license, an entity number from the state secretary of state, uh, California secretary of state, a copy of a, a current business license, or a business card and an attestation from the dealer that you are a small business in the landscaping area. The IM also includes details on how manufacturers, dealers, and owners participate in the requirements, and Jacob will be going over those requirements in a few slides. Um, now slide number six. Uh, this is straight from the draft IM. As I mentioned earlier, the equipment and battery incentive amount will be based on a 70% of the MSRP cost up to a specific dollar amount for the equipment type and, and battery charger, as you can see from this table. We received some feedback already that this table and some folks are confused of, of the up to amounts. The voucher amount will be based on the MSRP the manufacturer provides to CARB. We'll then pay up to 70% of the MSRP up to the amounts listed here. I hope that's clear. Um, you want your feedback on what you think, how can we make this table clear? Um, are these voucher amounts too high? Uh, are they too low? Are they right in the ballpark? We want to hear what you, what you think. Um, like I said, all, we also have the up to voucher equipment types for the, uh, like for example, like a walk behind mower has a cap of $1,250. As I mentioned at the start of the presentation, core allows stacking. For example, you could receive a core voucher amount for a walk behind mower and receive incentive funds from the Moyer program. You will then need to follow requirements of both programs and incentives could not exceed 100% of the equipment costs. Um, now I'll turn the presentation slides over uh, seven, eight, and nine over to Jacob uh, with CalStart. He'll go over the how the manufacturers, dealers, and purchasers, owners can participate in the program. Thanks, Todd. Uh, next slide, please. So building off lessons learned and best practices from the um, heavy duty equipment and core, uh, we're implementing a similar process um, for the professional landscape service equipment. So manufacturers will need to submit a equipment eligibility application, which is outlined in the draft attachment. Um, that I hope everyone's had opportunity to review. Um, CARB will review the um, application submitted by a manufacturer um, and determine if um, their application meets the criteria set forth in that equipment eligibility application and then deem the equipment um, either eligible or ineligible. Um, if the equipment becomes eligible, um, it will be listed on the core web website and it will be listed in the core eligibility equipment catalog um, for purchasers to um, review and pick what best fits the needs of their business. Uh, manufacturers are also going to help provide um, workforce training and development through their dealer and training networks. Um, and they will be providing a very important equipment support to um, their dealer network and purchasers through the core project. Next slide. Um, once a manufacturer becomes eligible, then their dealer um, network can um, start going through their process to become uh, core approved dealers. Um, the steps are, are fairly simple and fairly similar to um, um, what we've learned um, through the heavy duty um, categories in core. Um, and step one would be to um, 
take a core dealer training quiz and receive a score of 100%. Uh, dealers have multiple attempts to pass the quiz. The, the goal of that is to just ensure that the dealers that are participating in the program um, understand um, their role and responsibility um, and can best help the purchasers uh, pick the equipment that meets their needs. Uh, step two in the dealer steps to participate is to submit the required documentation. Dealers are required to submit and sign the terms and conditions, which again are outlined in the draft attachment, um, a W-9, and they must provide a letter from each manufacturer where they plan to uh, sell their equipment that um, deems them eligible to participate in the core project. Lastly, step three, dealers must attend the dealer information training session that's administered by CalStart. Um, each dealer, like I said, is required to take the quiz in step one, uh, submit the documentations in step two, and then the last step would be to um, participate in the training. And that's an opportunity for dealers and the project administrator here at CalStart to um, answer any questions and provide a little more detailed uh, in-person virtual training. Next slide, please. And then the final step, once a manufacturer um, has eligible equipment, there are core approved dealers. Now it's time for purchasers um, to actually get access to this zero emission equipment. Um, so purchasers will go and contact a core approved dealer, which will be listed on the CaliforniaCore.org webpage. They will work with that dealer to select eligible equipment from the uh, core eligible equipment catalog. They will provide the appropriate documentation to that dealer that will submit a voucher on their behalf. The voucher will be reviewed, and if deemed uh, eligible, the purchasers will sign terms and conditions, and then a voucher would be issued right there at the end of step two. Uh, step three, the purchaser would have received their voucher, and they could pay the remaining balance uh, for their equipment and take delivery in step four of their equipment. Step five would be between the dealer and the purchaser, where the dealer will provide any operational support and training um, to the purchaser to best use their newly purchased zero emission uh, uh, professional service equipment. So those are the general steps of how to participate for a manufacturer, a dealer, and a purchaser. Um, there is much more detail in the attached implementation manual, um, and we look forward to hearing feedback uh, from the stakeholders today on um, your thoughts on this general process. Next slide. Super. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. And uh, stick around. You might have some questions uh, from, from, from some folks. Um, I, I, I've been reminded that this. Um, Presentation is in Spanish also. If you have, uh, if you're Spanish speaking or, or uh, want to hear the, the uh, work group in Spanish, there is an interpretation button near the bottom. You click on the English you want to hear, whether English or Spanish, and uh, you can hear that in that, that language and use the interpretation services that we have provided. Para ustedes que nos andan juntando, que se andan juntando en, o están con nosotros en esta junta, uh, por favor, si gustarían escuchar la presentación en español, pueden usar el botón que dice intérprete y escoge en español. Toda la presentación se, se continuará en inglés, pero puede hacer sus preguntas en español o comentarios en español. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Eloy. Um, I also noticed there was a comment on uh, when this uh, presentation will be available. To, to watch uh, as recording. I try to get this up within a week or 10 days after uh, the presentation. 
and I've got to put this on our um, uh, the core website and also the um, oh forgetting the, the name of the other website, but we, it's in a couple of different places. And if you have questions, uh, you can always email me, and I, I will get you that link to this presentation. Um, here we're on slide number ten. I was also reminded to slow my speaking down because uh, there was interpretation going on. Um, this next slide is talk about the next steps. Uh, we'll try to incorporate the comments we hear today uh, for the final implementation manual, uh, or what we're calling Appendix D. But we'll have a work group meeting in the next few weeks to release that final document. And then the next day, we'll kick off the manufacturer and dealer program eligibility applications. We'll then uh, release the final implementation manual and provide the date uh, the vouchers will be open. That's slide number 11. Um, as I stated, we're planning a final work group in the next few weeks. If you know better ways for us to reach out to small businesses and pro landscapers, please contact me or send me an email. Uh, we'll be open to comments and questions. Uh, uh, now, portion of, of the meeting, uh, we ask that you raise your hand, let us know uh, what you'd like to ask, either a question or a comment. Uh, Eloy, Eloy will then unmute your line. For those who participating by a phone, please press number two to raise your hand and please state your name and affiliation so everybody knows who you are. Again, my name is Todd Sterling. Um, here's my email address. If you have questions or a comment you think of later after today, you want to share it with me, uh, send me an email. Uh, if you have a question about the core program, just write me an email. Um, but you know, here we go. So, so there's a lot of information. Um, let's let's kind of go into some questions and comments you have um, about the implementation manual or the core program. Um, if we have any raised hands, we'll kind of flip flop between uh, raised hands and uh, written questions. Uh, you know, five to seven questions, depending on how long it takes, and uh, we'll go back and forth. Uh, until we're done here. But Eli, do we have Let's, any raised hands today? Yeah, we got quite a few raised hands here. We're gonna okay. go ahead and start with uh, Ron Aslan. Ron, I'm gonna unmute your line. And there you go, Ron, go ahead. Oh, hi there, it's Ron Aslan from SD SQL in San Diego. Really Ron. wanted to congratulate the team on listening to our input. So uh, I feel like we went from adversarial to being very much working together. So. Uh, very happy with what you've done in the uh, third, the, this version of the implementation manual. I think to me, the most important thing is that 25K cap. Uh, that really, I think, protects a lot of this money uh, for the small businesses that we want to get to. And also I liked your system of the smaller companies getting the first 180 days. Uh, just kind of a question about outreach. So if we want to tell people where to look, there'll be a a specific website to go to in core so that a small business can can figure out how to take part right right and i think we're we already have that um system already on the uh, calstar page mm -hmm. so if you go to the calstar page there's already a link that takes you right to um except right now it has carb accepting public comment on a draft i am link for landscaping and you submit it right there and that's kind of a little side web page already in the core uh, the, the CalSTAR core page. Jacob, do you want to add anything to that? More, more specific? No, I think you answered it. Yeah, on the CaliforniaCore.org webpage, there is a specific professional landscaping page where all this information is being housed. And then as we approach the actual launch of vouchers, there'll be obviously more updates and more information um, being released there as well. So I guess what I'm looking for is... Uh, that the link will stay the same so that as we start spreading the word, uh, the link won't change. The, the link for the website, no. If you're talking about specifically to the attachment, um, that will probably live there for a, a while. Um, okay. um, so, and obviously that's a, that's a draft right now. It's not the final, but we definitely would like that to be shared so we could you know, get feedback on it. And then will that web page be bilingual? Yes, so uh, the whole California Core webpage has a translation option at the top, and you can pick between, you know, a, a multitude of languages. It's multilingual. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, thank Ron. You, Ron. And I would uh, those folks who have uh, written in questions, your your questions will be answered here just shortly. We got a few more raised hands. We're going to go over to 
Uh, Regan Barry, Regan, your line is open. Regan, are you there? All right, I'm going to. Yeah. There I'm you go. There we go. There you go. Uh, thanks for the work you're doing to put this in front of us so we can at least take advantage of the program. Uh, uh, owner of a landscape contracting company, Coastal Evergreen, uh, member of the CLCA. I'm, I'm curious about the voucher amount of $300. Is that for each piece of equipment or is that total for any of those pieces of equipment that were listed in that top heading? Yeah, so that's the up to amount. So really, so if you look at, let's, let's do an example of say like a uh, pole saw, right? You wanna get a pole saw and the MSRP from the manufacturers, whatever amount, uh, we'll pay up to 70% of that voucher amount or the MSRP up to $300 per piece of equipment in, in that category. In the walk behind mowers, uh, say the MSRP for a piece of equipment is $1,000, uh, we'll pay $700. Um, if the piece of equipment is over $1,250, I will pay up to $1,250 per piece of equipment. Does right. that make sense, Reagan? Yeah, it does. It helps uh, because if that was all thrown into one amount, that would certainly not be a great incentive. Yeah, that's per piece of equipment. Right. Okay. All right. Thank okay. you so much for your comment. Let's go over to... Uh, Tom, Tom Foyte, uh, am I pronounced that correctly? And Tom, can you? Uh, there we go. There you go. Uh, it's Thomas Foyte, uh, Marin Garden Solutions. Thank you. I appreciate you guys going through all the work and doing all this. Uh, it's of great need, I think, for the micro landscaping business. My question is uh, there's a current fairly heavy backlog of um, electric devices on order. So I'm kind of curious how the voucher program is going to work if, for instance, all of a sudden there is a huge rush and you know, if I go in and I can't receive a piece of equipment or pieces of equipment for three months, is the voucher, can I get the voucher specific to me? And when the items come in, do I have to prepay them? How, what are your thoughts on that? And how is that gonna all work out? Uh, that's a great question, Tom. And we have heard there are some, from some companies there are some uh, backlogs, but well, yeah, once you're, once you're in line, it's a first come first serve program. Once you're in line, you have that voucher in hand. Um, that's, that's your, your uh, ticket to get that piece of equipment. Um, I don't know if, if Jacob wants to add anything to that as far as you know, timelines or. or um... Yeah, I think I, I, uh, I think to the center of the question is more of, you know, how long is if if a voucher is issued, how long would it be eligible for or excuse me, how long would it be valid for? Um, and that's what we're here today to solicit feedback on. Um, so it's it sounds like there, there could be kind of a, a waiting game once equipment is ordered. Um, until you know you can get it from the manufacturer, so we're definitely open to that feedback on what the time frame should be until that voucher expires, because we, we you know we will need to to kind of hone in on that detail. So um, Thomas, any any input you have would be greatly appreciated. If that's you know three months, six months, twelve months, um, you know that that's all open for discussion today. So. Right, that's perfect. Uh, I think the uh, the sellers or the producers would mm -hmm. be more, you know, would be better able to handle that particular question. Um, all I know is that there's usually a backlog or you know a constraint to the number of items you can get and when you can get them. Uh, since I'm not part of the, uh, you know, she. Yeah, it, since I'm not part of the uh, that particular field, um, I don't have a great knowledge in that. Yeah, okay. it, well, it yeah. is some, it is something we've heard in the past, yeah. and uh, so we're trying to work through that. Well, we work with the dealers, so if there's any issues with uh, um, 
the manufacturing or the de deployment or if there is a delay in delivery, then they would let us know if it impacts like, um, especially if it impacts their specific dealership. Yeah. Then they'll give us a time, they'll give us a time frame. So it, it won't be on the own, the onus won't be on the purchaser. Right. That's good. And I, I appreciate that. Um, my, uh, oh, I think, I think that was it. Uh, that was the only question I had. I appreciate uh, you guys thinking about that and uh, obviously it'll be addressed. So that's fantastic. Thank you. All right. And uh, the, we got uh, Chris Benz, Chris. Thank you. Um, my question is, will you be preparing any more materials for outreach, particularly in Spanish? Well, we do, we do uh, right now we do have a little handout that's in English and in Spanish that's on the uh, California Core webpage. Uh, we can hand out that's a little handout. And uh, as far as outreach to Spanish, we, we are working on uh, we just re completed a, uh, an, an announcement for an RFP for uh, outreach. And that will also be focusing on English and in Spanish. Great, thank you very much. Um, where would where will we be able to access the piece then when it's created? Are you thinking? It'll be on that CaliforniaCore.org um, website right. and then on the professional landscaping portion of that web page. Great, thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. We have a few more hands, but we're, let's go ahead and switch over to uh, some of the written questions that have been, uh, some those have been answered and a few that are open. Uh, I'm going to let my colleague uh, Matthew Diener um, uh, give us a quick rundown of some of the things that we're seeing in the uh, Q&A box. Matt? Thank you, Hila. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Yes. All right. So we've had a couple inquiries as to if a link to this video will be made available. Uh, in the chat, we've replied that this will be available on the CaliforniaCore.org website for the landscaping page and also on the CARB. Uh, hosted a website under meetings and events for the California Core program. Uh, you have any issues reaching that uh, website, please reach out to the staff. That question was from Chris McGuire. Our next question is from anonymous attendee. Is there a way where dealer attestation with a driver's license for a purchaser is only an option if the buyer does not have a valid C27 contractor's license, nor is a valid corporation, nor has a business license. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So right now uh, in the draft um, implementation manual, we have a couple of different options for uh, somebody to participate in the program. Uh, the, the first is uh, everybody would need to have a California driver's license or, or a California driver uh, ID number. And then uh, one, one of the following options. So either a C27 landscape contractor's license number. Uh, the second option would be an entity number from the California Secretary of State. Uh, the third would be a copy of a current and valid business license. And the third would be a business card of your business and the dealer attestation. Um, if we could hear a little bit more detail from uh, anonymous attendee, if that doesn't work, or if there's another way we can do this while still, um, you know, keeping the integrity of the program, make sure that we're getting this, this equipment to the right folks, uh, we'd like to hear that. Okay. Next question is again from an anonymous attendee. It is, how long before the core catalog of eligible equipment is ready? It's a great question. So right now we're releasing the draft implementation manual, try and get some feedback on this, to try to tighten this uh, implementation manual up as, as best we can, uh, taking your feedback and, and, and uh, updating the, the implementation manual. We'll be having a release of a final implementation manual here in the next few weeks. Once that uh, meeting happens, uh, via a meeting just like this, uh, only be the final implementation manual. Uh, the next day we'll be opening the doors for um, manufacturer and dealer um, applications to get into the program. Uh, and that'll be open for, I'm guessing, uh, you know, a month, uh, maybe six weeks. 
to allow time for folks to um, get their equipment in the catalog, um, get dealers on board and understand the program. And then once that time frame is up, then we'll open it up to vouchers and owners and, and uh, operators can purchase their equipment through, through the uh, voucher process. All right. Uh, Joy Walters asked, what was step five for purchasers on the slide? And Jacob Woodson has answered, uh, previous purchaser receives operator training from dealer. Um, yeah, that, that slide was hard to see. Um, the slides are on our webpage if you want to see the full slides. Um, all right. The next question is from Carolyn Marston. Who is going to reach out to dealers? And when? Well, we, we've been trying to reach out to dealers with uh, CalStart. Uh, um, has reached out to quite a few dealers already, uh, trying to get their input on you know how this process works, how, how we can, uh, the, what kind of equipment, the, the, the equipment amount, and and how how they work and how they work with zero emission equipment. Uh, we've been doing that for the past few months. Um, if there's a dealer or a, a network or some other um, avenue for us to reach out to the California dealers. Uh, please reach out to me. Uh, we'd love to hear that. And uh, we would love to get in, in contact with this uh, program so they understand what's going on and they could participate in this program. Our next question comes from Sanda Giardi. Uh, since a qualifying, since part of qualifying is having less than 25 employees, a micro business, um, or less or 100 or fewer employees as a small business or having below a certain revenue threshold, how would an equipment dealer confirm that prior to doing an attestation? Well, what we're hearing from the dealers is that um, they know they know their customers. Uh, they understand their customers. They've been working with, with them for years uh, with their um, internal combustion equipment. And we can, we can keep moving forward um, like that. Um, they're going to have to ask some questions, right? They're going to have to ask questions when they fill out the uh, voucher application anyway. And this will just be another question that they'll need to ask, whether they're uh, in number of employees or um, trying to get an idea of the revenue thresholds. So, so that's, that's one way to do it. Um, if you, again, if you have better options or uh, know some other way to do this, that, that makes it more equitable. Uh, we'd, we'd love to hear that from, from you, Sarah, or Sandra, sorry. All right, let's switch back to uh, raise hands now. All right, thanks, Matt. Uh, let's see, I got Jesus Flores. Jesus, uh, you are up. Let's see if that, uh, did that work? There we go. Can you guys hear me? Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. Okay, great. I have, uh, thank you for all, all this information you guys are giving us, but I'm totally new on this. And uh, one of my questions is, I really don't see any equipment that is gonna replace what we currently have, uh, something that is gonna match uh, what we have, or at least get close to, who do I ask those questions? Or we are going to have something that is gonna be at least 70% close in terms of uh, volume of uh, power to replace what we have. Right, so um, work with your dealer. I don't, I don't know who your dealer is or, or um, uh, what, what part, of the, part of the state you're in, but uh, work with a dealer so you can they can understand how you work, right? How, how you and your crews work. So whether you work all day or just here, here and there, um, they have the uh, zero emission equipment that um, can help you get your job done. So, you know, whether that's, you know, borderline uh, residential equipment or full on commercial equipment, um, they, they can help you with that. And then, you know, there's, there's a whole variety of things from, you know, smaller uh, leaf blowers with just a cartridge battery to leaf blowers with a lot of power with a backpack battery that can last a, a lot longer and have more power. All right, thank you. Okay. Um, if I can just expand on that, the, uh, Jesus, there, 
would be, um, I'd also recommend looking at some of the events that some manufacturers are putting on for you to have the opportunity to look and use some of the equipment and uh, give you the opportunity to hear from them. And, uh, uh, and just like um, Todd mentioned, uh, they can also gather information about how you're using yeah. recommendations. Thank you so much for your comment. Oh, so I think I may have uh, uh, muted you on accident. If you um, need to continue, feel free to raise your hand again. Um, I will move on to uh, Mr. Glover, Brandon Glover. Hi, how you doing? This is Brandon Glover from Still. Um, Hi, I just had a quick question. Hey, uh, good job so far, you guys. Uh, appreciate all the, the information. On, on that screen that you're on right now, the voucher amount, I just wanted to ask a couple questions about that because currently equipment, there's, there's two types of uh, equipment sold. You have stuff that's kind of a la carte. That's how we sell a lot of our professional equipment where you sell it with uh, the unit by itself and then you'd buy the battery and the charger separately. There's some units that we offer and other manufacturers offer that as a whole kit together. So um, I guess I was wondering kind of how you, your thought is on the voucher amount, how it breaks down versus I see you have um, for equipment type and then you also have batteries and chargers. Right, so, so that's what we're, we're looking at all, all together here. So if you have a, 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 say a edger, a battery and a charger all in one, uh, that would be in the first line, that would be up to $300. But if you're doing the a la carte method, which is an edger, uh, you get up to $300 there. And then say you wanted a, a couple cartridge batteries, you could get up to $1,000 in cartridge batteries and then uh, get a charge with that also. So you could do that, you know, a la carte on the different, different line items here on, on this equipment table. All right, that sounds great. That's what I need to know. Thank you so much, you guys. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, Suzanne Hume. Suzanne, you are... Hi, this is actually uh, John Bodorf. Um, I for the Clean Earth for Kids at Org. I wanted to uh, echo the comment uh, Ron made from SD Sequel. Uh, you know, thank you for the cap uh, on the limits to protect the money for small operators and companies. And I also wanted my other comment would be that uh, you know please do is you know more outreach to notify landscapers and others, you know, particularly the smaller operators. Uh, this program is coming and how to use it. Um, you know, how to get in touch with their dealers and particularly, you know, the type of equipment that's available. Um, and, you know, especially all this information needs to be done in Spanish and other languages as well. Um, you know, this, this program is so important to protect people's lungs and, uh, you know, reduce air pollution. Um, so we're you know, really looking forward to, you know, moving this, you know, moving all this forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Those are all good points. And if you have another way for us to outreach to especially smaller businesses that, you know, don't belong to associations, uh, you know, don't belong to any other other you know landscaping groups. Um, you reach out to me, and I'd lo love to uh, you know pass some stuff through you or or write to them. So if you could do that, that'd be great. All right, uh, let me move on to um, actually, uh, if, if you could in in the um, in the Q and A box. Uh, add uh, some recommended languages that uh, based on from your organization, if you know of any other languages that you recommend, I'd be much appreciated. Thank you. Um, Martin, uh, and I don't want to mess this up, uh, St Stukinski, I'm going to go ahead and open up your mic. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. sir. Loud and clear. Oh, yeah, I had two questions. Uh, is the voucher program up and running now, or I believe you maybe addressed this already? It's going to take another month or so. Or yes, so the voucher program for for this part of core will open up in a, in a few months. Uh, we're trying to once we get this implementation manual finalized, uh, we can start opening up for just the dealers and the equipment to get them eligible and on on the list. And once we get that in line, then we can open up to the purchasers. Very good, thank you. Also, uh, if this thirty million dollars runs out, is there any additional funding, you know, planned to expand the program? This this uh, funding was set aside from the SB one hundred and seventy funds, uh, thirty million dollars. That's what we're spending right now. Um, I can't. Uh, my my crystal ball is a little fuzzy. Not sure what what it looks like in the future, but um, we'll, we'll see what happens. If if, if it ha if it works out, we can we have a system in place already that we can uh, you know 
we've gone through the process already that we have in the last few months of uh, how this pro program will work and, and how we can make, make it better. Um, and so we have everything in place already. Thank you. I represent a group in San Jose. And of course, we're trying to convert users to electric leaf blowers, weed trimmers, et cetera, to reduce air pollution, reduce noise pollution, and result in a better quality of life for all of us. Thank you. Well, welcome to the group. And um, like, like we've been trying all along here, if, if you have a if you are an avenue for outreach, um, you take our materials and, and send them to, to the folks that you know and have been working with. We'd really appreciate it. Thanks. I'll keep I'll keep tabs on your website, et cetera. Super. Thank you. And I've got uh, um, Lauren Elkin. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Yeah, my, my concern goes back to the, the uh, gentleman who was talking about the, the um, leaf blower specifically in terms of the blowing force. Um, CARB uses and uh, the national standard uses newtons as to measure blowing force. And the problem is, um, you know, still, I'll just use an example the still, this, this, uh, any of the equipment that we're seeing is sitting around 21 newtons. And in fact, we're using higher, higher, higher volume leaf blowers at 41 newtons. That's a 50% change in what's going on. So the, the only option that we have is we have to hire, we have to get two machines and two people to go ahead and do the same, same thing in terms of blowing force um, for what we've got going on. So, I, you know, that's a real concern that, hey, it's great that I'm replacing it, but I've got to, I'm gonna have to hire more people and hire more machines to go ahead and do that. And I think that's something that you need to be looking at in terms of, as you're talking about, oh yes, uh, go talk to your dealer. Um, a number of the dealers are all saying the same thing to us. Hey, I'm sorry, it's just not, they just don't have the same, they don't have the same blowing force. So it's, it's not apples for apples, it's apples to pineapple. So again, that's talking about blowing force and newtons for uh, leaf blowers, which is the biggest, the biggest issue that most of the cities are having now. Second question I have is, is there anything that CARB could put out so that the city stop going ahead and, and eliminating all gas powered uh, landscaping equipment because they're trying to go ahead and, and help the environment? Um, because what's that, what's that doing is it's creating economic chaos for us and makes it exceptionally difficult I realize that you don't have control over the cities per se, but putting something out formally that's aggressively saying, hey, look, folks, we've got a plan here. You don't need to be going ahead and cutting everybody off would certainly be very helpful because um, we're seeing a number of cities now where they're saying 100% of all gas powered is going to be gone in the next six months. That's it, period. All because they want to help the environment and they feel like they're, they're following through with the governor's uh, executive order. Thank you. Yeah, I think, Lauren, that you did touch on the fact that cities have their own jurisdiction, so we really cannot um, interfere with that, but we can certainly inform more about like, what we're doing. We've been meeting with some cities that have been reaching out and considering ordinances. Other, others have um, already done that, so we can't do anything about what has already passed in their local regions, but uh, we, we hear you and we're trying to make sure that everybody is aware of our efforts. So. Yeah, to touch on your, your, your first question uh, or question comment about uh, the power of the uh, equipment. Uh, that, that I've, I've heard a little bit of that, not a lot, but I've also heard that the dealers um, are happy to work with folks to get the right piece of equipment that they need to go from uh, internal combustion to zero emission. All right, thank you, Todd. We're gonna switch back over to um some of the written questions now. Matt, you have any uh, additional written questions? Yes, we've got a dozen or better currently. Question is regarding where stakeholders can find the draft version of uh, attachment D. This was answered in the Q&A already. I'll just reemphasize that on the californiacore.org website, uh, there's a link there for the, the landscaping portion of the program. And on that page is a link to the current draft document, as well as you know, previous documents uh, and presentations for this portion of the program. So the next question is in attachment D, it outlines $10 million for micro businesses and 17 million for other businesses. Where did the other 3 million go? Right, so um, 
some of that, most of that funding has gone to administration funds. So CARV takes um, a certain percentage to do our, our administration. We also um, have uh, our project administrator, CalSTAR, do a lot of the work for us. So that's you know, processing the vouchers, training the dealers, um, working on the uh, implementation manual, and um, a lot of things that uh, you know we, we don't see behind the scenes. They they get the money for that. All right. Next question is this: funding capped at twenty five thousand dollars per eligible purchaser. Why can't that be tiered so any sole proprietor, single operator? Uh, who qualifies as a micro business gets enough funding for one set of ZEE equipment. 25,000 in voucher eligibility for a sole proprietor is way more than such a sole proprietor single operator landscaper would need. Implementing a lower funding cap for sole proprietors only serves to expand the number of landscapers to help to be helped by this funding program. Well, I, I mean, I set the the, the cap at twenty five thousand dollars. Looking at, you know, what it would take to fill up a trailer, right? So if you need an edger, a trimmer, hole saw, maybe some new blowers, walk behind more, and a ride on more, and then batteries to um, keep that trailer um, and the equipment moving for for a day. And depending on on you know what state part of the state you're in and what kind of work you do, it could be higher, it could be lower. But I, I thought that twenty five thousand dollars was was a good a starting point. Um, that's that's why we're here. That, that if you think that number should be higher, or you think it should be lower, uh, we can we can we can look at that. But um, that that's where I came up with that, with that number. Yeah, it was for the trailer. The other thing is is that with the purchaser cap, we originally had it at a hundred thousand. And so what I what we'll evaluate based on that comment that we just heard was um, it sounds like an even more tiered effect which it, that's really difficult to kind of manage. I'm more, I'm more concerned about outreach to the sole proprietor for them to be able to find time in their day to apply for funding or to get new pieces of equipment. So we'll think about that. Next question, will the CaliforniaCore.org website have a dealer's list specific to landscape and equipment, or will it be part of the current dealer's list focused on freight equipment? I'm envisioning this as, as two, two lists. And we have a, 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 a set aside portion of the website just for land, pro landscaping. And from way off here, Jacob, you can, you can jump in. <laughs> but uh, it, it will have a, a dealer list just for pro landscapers to, to try to avoid any confusion between the two different core programs. Yeah, that's, that's accurate, Todd. In the, in the coming weeks, you know, as we get through more of this, um, uh, you know, implementation manual attachment deed development work and we actually start having some some more concrete um, information to publish after we solicit all the feedback from today and prior work groups we'll start to see the website you know adapting and morphing into what it what it will look like to really educate the consumer um, on the landscaping uh, component of core um, where yeah there'll be there'll be separate um, tabs um, or pages that are specific to landscaping um, that separates the freight equipment from, from landscaping. Next question is, is the voucher program up and running now or when will it be in operation? So this part of the core voucher program is not up and running yet, but we have the draft limitation manual that we're talking about now. Um, it will be finalized um, with the comments, including the comments that we received today and, and shortly after this. And then we'll once we finalize it, we'll open it up to uh, eligibility for manufacturer's equipment and dealers. And then once that is done, uh, we'll open it up to uh, voucher pro processing in a few months. Next question. If the $30 million runs out, are other funds being allocated? So this program, uh, the pro landscaping core portion of the program uh, received thirty million dollars from SB one hundred and seventy. Um, that is a one time set aside for for this uh, portion of uh, zero emission. Um, I don't. I'm not sure. Like I mentioned earlier, uh, my crystal ball is fuzzy. Not sure if we'll be getting other funds. But again, uh, we have uh, this program already set up, and if we do get more funds, it'll be much easier to go through this process than than uh, we the work that we've done the last few months. Um, you, you all included. 
Next question, are the amounts for batteries for each battery? So that is for, no. So you can, you say, so for cartridge batteries, the cartridge battery uh, that we're showing here is up to $1,000. Um, we'll, we'll pay the MSR, 70% of the MSRP of the cartridge batteries, um, as many as you'd like, um, up to $1,000. Uh, same with backpack batteries. If you could get uh, three backpack batteries, uh, for, for, for under $300,000, um, you can do that also. I hope that makes sense. If this table is not making sense, and if you know a better way to um, lay this out, um, we, we'd like to hear it. We try to make it as simple as possible, uh, but also um, try to get the point across. Our next question, besides the website, what other forms of marketing will CORE do to bring exposure to the program? That's a great question. So recently, um, our, our, uh, our, pro our project um, administrator, uh, CalStart, uh, just sent out an RFP. Uh, this is for a, a long-term outreach pro program. Um, we can go in a little more detail on that. Um, that's still in, in the... Uh, you know, they're, they're still, um, what, do you, what do you call it? Uh, not testing, but um, grading portion of that. But um, it is a pretty extensive program over the next few years to outreach to this um, stakeholder group. So they understand the equipment, um, so they can work with it, uh, safety portion of it, and just general outreach uh, for, the, for this stakeholder group. Next question is, Will we be made aware of when the sign-up period is in advance, or do we have to keep hitting the website? No, you don't have to keep hitting the website. You can go to the website and you can uh, sign up for the listserv. The listserv will send you and, and any notifications that we have for, for this program or other ARB programs that you sign up for. And uh, so you don't have to keep going onto the webpage and looking at for it daily. That has to be very boring. But uh, we will send you stuff um, if you sign up for that listserv, if you can't find that, um, send me an email and I'll help you sign up for that. Next question is, hi Todd, have you reached out to the San Diego list of dealers that SQL provided you? I think we did. I think we, I think I passed it on to our project administrator at CalStart. And, um, I think they've, they've um, reached out to those folks already. Um, if not, uh, we'll, we'll be doing that soon. Next comment is, I believe $400 is too low for a backpack blower. Okay. Um, anonymous attendee, if you could uh, give us a, what you think it would be with some, with some data, um, we'd really appreciate it. Next question, businesses may not be willing to share specifics and may have concerns about the security of their information. Will purchasers be required to answer exactly what their annual income is or just state whether they are above or below the specified ranges for each business category? I don't, I don't think we need your exact income, but... Uh... Those are the top ranges for a small business. So, you know, anything below, below, you know, if you're a micro business, anything below that, um, or anything between or higher than the micro business to a small business would be all that we need to know. At the time of purchase. At the time of purchase, yeah. Next question. I feel that the $1,000 for battery is too low. Why $5,000 for chargers? I think that that amount should be swapped. Batteries are the most expensive items to buy. Right, so look at cartridge, uh, cartridge batteries are the smaller batteries that would you know, fit some handheld pieces of equipment. Uh, we thought that was a pretty good price for to get a, you know, a few different uh, cartridge batteries for your, for your equipment to get you through the day. Um, chargers uh, range all over the place. You get a, a fairly inexpensive charger, you know, probably under fifty to seventy-five dollars uh, for a, a cartridge. Um, but there's also some really expensive ones that can hold multiple uh, cartridge batteries and uh, charge those simultaneously at different charge rates. And uh, same with 
bigger powered uh, backpack batteries. So, you know, power management. So, so we think it's correct. Um, if you have better information or have um, you know better data that we can use, um, if you could share that, we'd really appreciate it. Next is a comment that says, I would recommend adding Vietnamese as a language in addition to English and Spanish for your outreach materials. Thank you, we can do that. Next is from Jeff uh, Sensmeyer with Intellect. Uh, will hybrid electric ride on slash stand on mowers be included in the voucher program? Um, no, this program is only for zero emission equipment, not uh, hybrid electric equipment. Next question is, can you please clarify that in attachment D, it says the equipment must be sold at no less than MSRP. To be clear, anytime core eligible landscape equipment may be placed on sale by a dealer, that piece of equipment is no longer eligible unless the purchaser pays full price minus the amount of the voucher. Right, so it would be, be really difficult to continually be adjusting the price of equipment uh, day to day, week by week, uh, depending on you know group discounts, transactions. I mean, there's all the different various ways. This is the easiest way we found to to do this. Um, use the MSRP and then uh, take the seventy percent discount off of that. If 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 there's a better way to do it, um, we're all ears. But um, that's the easiest way uh, we're we're fine to do this. Next question. Uh, vouchers values seem a bit high for the battery and charger. For instance, I see the MSRP of a backpack battery at $1,500. Uh, and there's a link provided to a Gardenland you know, steel product, for instance. Uh, so thank you for your consideration. Right. So what's it Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead so what's interesting about this table is that the equipment type uh, rows are actually per equipment type. The battery and the chargers are per purchaser. So that so that there might be a different number of batteries that meet that mark. But since there is a purchaser cap of $25,000 in total for the pro participation of the program. So we need to look at how to like rework or reword or maybe separate this table out. But essentially, if you would look at that tab the table this way, where it's per equipment type for the uh, top four rows, and then after that, the batteries and chargers is per purchaser, and that's the most you can get. All right. We have, could you, next question is, could you post your guidance to cities emphasizing CARB has a plan in place? And cities and counties accelerating, eliminating gas-powered equipment isn't supported by CARB? Right now, we can find, we, right now we can find anything where the CARB has published any guidance to the cities. I think, uh, Laura, I think, I think we just answered this verbally. Yeah. Uh, this, is, uh, this is also, this is from Lauren, so yeah. Right. So. Next question. In addition to the list of participating dealers, will the list of eligible equipment be there also? Will online sales be allowed by dealers or businesses not located in California? So, so the participating dealers and the list of eligible equipment will be on our webpage. If you look at our webpage now for the heavy duty equipment, um, it's pretty clear. And, and, and I, think it's, I think it's pretty clear. Um, and uh, an easy way to pick out a dealer and your equipment. And I think it would be very similar when we do the pro landscaping portion of it. Um, online sales, um, we have not talked about that very much in these, in these meetings. We'd really like folks to work through a dealer. This is new equipment that um, most people haven't used. We'd like to use that dealer as a, as a training partner, right? So you understand the equipment, get in their hands, understand how it works. And, and you know, like, like I responded to an earlier uh, caller and a uh, commenter, to work with your dealer so you understand the equipment that you need um, for, your, for, your, for your business. Um, so so just, just go walking into a, a dealership or buying something online, um, may or may not be the right piece of equipment for you, and it may um, be not the, may not be the right piece of equipment, and may not serve the needs that you need uh, as you 
if you work through a dealer, they can understand what you need and the power that you need. All right, next comment is a stakeholder indicating the five amp hour battery costs $330 and eight amp hour battery can be close to $500. I think this was in reference to a previous comment regarding- Right, right. So, so to go back to this table, that's that's the up to amount. So if you look at a cartridge battery and say the cartridge battery is $330, you can buy almost three of them and um, you give up to $1,000 and buy multiple batteries for, for your piece of equipment. Um, I I'm trying to make this table as clear as possible. Um, again, this is the up to amount. This is not the MSRP amounts or the max, this is the max amount you can get per, per line. All right, let's go back to the raise hands now. Thanks, Matt. We have a few, we do have a few raised hands here. Uh, I'm going to go with uh, Gretchen uh, Schubeck. hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Gretchen? Yeah, I'm sorry. Were you thinking about Christian? Uh, no, but I think your line is open. So uh, I, I, have it as, I have it as Gretchen. Okay, sorry. This is Christian Nissen um, up here in Northern California. A uh, couple of questions I have is uh, if I go out and buy an edger uh, and a hedger and a trimmer and a chainsaw and a pole saw, am I only going to receive up to a $300 for all those four or up to $300 each? Each. Okay. Okay. And if I don't buy a ride on mower, will the, uh, the cap still be at 25000 it's always the same, regardless of what equipment type you're buying. Okay. That's okay. a purchaser cap. Okay. Uh, more important, um, so it's it's really difficult. Uh, now, I've got a C27 license, and I know a lot of people who maintain yards don't have a C27 and don't need a C27 to maintain yards. But I think it's really important to set uh, some sort of rule as far as what you need to prove. I would say either EDD number, FE, FEIN number, or proof of insurance. Uh, because if you have a business license with a town, that money is going to dry up really quick. Okay, Christian, we're here, we're here earlier and we, we listed out the, the uh, required supporting documentation we have right now in the draft. Yeah, but you also you also said just a business card, right? Anybody can have a business card, right? And I just don't think that's going to be good enough because I really think you need to prove that you're a legitimate business. Gotcha. Because in California, for example, if I can get a business card printed up, and you can go out and start maintaining yards, but that doesn't prove that you are a legitimate business having an EDD number, an FEIN number, or having insurance. So for the business card, um, Todd, correctly, correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought for the business card that that was additional documentation with the dealer's attestation. So the dealer is putting themselves on the, they're standing in your stead. They're putting them, their, their participation in the program on the line because they're valid, they're verifying you know, who you are and what you do. Correct. No, I understand that, but just because you have a business card doesn't mean you are that you have an EDD number, FEIN number. You don't need to have a C27 license to maintain yards. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. But, but you, for me, it's important for somebody to show that they're either paying their taxes or they have insurance, because otherwise this money is going to dry up real quick. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so what I heard from you were for the other examples beyond the C27 was the EDD, FIN, and or proof of insurance. There were the, those were the three that I had heard. Okay. Correct. Yeah, you don't need to have a C27 to, to maintain. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thank you so much. And let's go with uh, Thomas again. Uh, Thomas Foti, I think you raised your hand again. 
Yes, I did. Thank you so much for getting back to me. Um, uh, getting to the previous caller, uh, there is definitely, that was one of the things that concerns me is um, it would be very possible. Is there a way that you're ensuring uh, tools are not purchased at 70% discount and then sold at the far or at the um, at the uh, the wholesale markets for you know eighty percent of cost. Uh, that was a concern. And going to proof of business or paying taxes, basically proof that you actually have a business uh, that you're operating correctly in the state of California would be of importance. Uh, so I appreciated that comment. Um, and I'm sure you guys are thinking about it with the FIN and the EDD number insurances, et cetera. Um, getting back to, I'm sorry, I have a couple points cause I know there's been a bit since I last spoke, but the gas blower power for the electric is far less or uh, excuse me, the gas, plow, gas blowers are far stronger than the electric. Um, so that one caller was absolutely correct as well, stating that you require almost two backpack batteries to compensate for one gas. And you have to have another two batteries charging at the same time. And each backpack battery is $1,500 plus tax each. So if I'm going to be working, you know, uh, doing for my maintenance guys to be working, uh, they basically need, we need at least two to four backpack batteries in a truck. Two are charging, two are being used, and then they can get swapped out because the time that they last for at full power is an hour maybe. Um, let's see here. Sorry, I know I'm making a lot of comments. No, that's uh, fine, that's, that's, that's why we're here. That's yep. good, that's good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, is there a plan or is there going to be a plan in place regarding the recycling of the batteries? Because we're worried about clean air, clean, you know, clean everything. Um, but right now, when you have a lithium ion backpack battery and it dies on you after a few years because of planned obsolescence or whatever right use etc right now it literally gets thrown into a landfill and um that's horrible horrible where it's basically poisoning the the water so that's another we desperately need to get some form of recycling uh, ramped up as well for all of this electric equipment. Thomas, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And we've heard this comment um, often over the, over the past few months as, as, as we've been working on this. And I think uh, between CalSART and, and ARB, we've reached out to all the zero emission manufacturers. Maybe we didn't, but I, I think we did. And we've asked this question to all of them. And I would have to say, I would say most of them, maybe they ask all of them, most of them have a program where once a battery, you know, either uh, is past its useful life, it doesn't work anymore, the program where you can send it back into the manufacturer and you, you get like a, a, a discount on, on a new battery. So, so it does get thrown into the landfill, but it gets back and, and recycled some, some way and then uh, you can get a new battery. So not to fully contradict, but... Uh... I recently at the store where I purchased my electric tools, not to throw still under the bus, but there was a, uh, they went through, still has their um, uh, uh, tutorial meetings regarding the new upcoming equipment and such, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the questions in the meeting that was asked was the recycling of materials and the representative and I quote, said, I have no idea, for all I know, they burn them, end quote. Okay, that's, that's, that's not good to hear. Okay. No, no. 
I would just like to add also part of the attachment D um, and, you know, we're looking for manufacturers and other stakeholders to provide their feedback, but part of the uh, equipment eligibility application is a, is a criteria for the manufacturers to supply the end of life disposal plan for the batteries. And Thank so that you. is something that through CORE's equipment eligibility process, we will be taking a look at and, you know, working with manufacturers to, to ensure that there is some some thought and process in place for for disposing of those, you know, either obsolete or, or, or dead dead batteries. So it's it's something we're thinking about, and we appreciate your feedback. Yeah, no, that's super important. I really appreciate you guys uh, jumping the gun on that one because it's uh, it is of concern. I mean, it's not just. I understand the desire for you know, the, the gas powered blowers are irritating and they pollute all the gas equipment is polluting and it's, it is terrible, but, um, you know, it's frustrating to see people with blinders on only saying, well, electric, electric, electric with no thought of anything to the future or even how the products are made, for instance, right? I mean, everything pollutes to some degree, uh, I would love for it to be zero pollution from end, from start to end, but um, I know realistically that is not possible, not fully. Thank you, uh, Thomas, for your comment. Your comments. Um, Thank you. And then Eloy, is there who's the is there another one? Not the person with the raised hand. Yes, um, Todd Zimmerman. Todd. Hi, are you able to hear me? Yes. Yes, real clear. Thank you. So I'll, I'll just touch on a couple of things. My name is Todd Zimmerman. I'm over here in Charlotte, North Carolina with Crest uh, Outdoor Power Equipment. Um, just to speak to the last call, I believe it was Thomas for recycling. Uh, it, it, first, I'll apologize for the comment from the steel manufacturer. Um, that's not acceptable from any manufacturer with the amount of batteries. Uh, there's a recycling program that's already in place called RC. RB that most manufacturers should already be part of. Um, the other part of that is what that RCRB sets up is retailers to be a recycling drop-off center. So any dealer can join, join that program to be a recycling drop-off center for lithium-ion batteries. Um, it's one of the things that as we launch Crest, we're going to start speaking to the dealers that come on board to mention that to them to see if they want to join. Uh, it, there's not a lot to it. It's a drop-off center. All you basically do is have a, a cardboard box and Ziploc bag so that the batteries go in in a safe manner so that the contacts don't touch each other. And then the program itself comes around and picks those batteries up on a frequent basis and recycles them appropriately. Um, so again, from a manufacturing standpoint, I completely apologize. No manufacturer should should tell you that from a recycling standpoint, because we all look at this very strictly. Um, from a Crest standpoint, uh, parent company, Positech, we report each month how many batteries that we've put out into the marketplace. And then we work with RBRC to track batteries that have been returned through their program. So it, it's available out there now. Um, the other part that I heard uh, as well was from a power standpoint, uh, I would just say in the next six months, just please be on the lookout for outdoor power equipment that will have the same power, achievable power as gas equivalent. So you won't, a landscaper won't have to sacrifice the power of the product from going to gas to cordless. Now, from a blower standpoint, I do understand the concern there that, look, from a manufacturing standpoint, the one piece that we're all trying to figure out is how to get a blower, which is a power hog, it's power hungry to get as much force you can out of there um, and the runtime that's needed. So there is some training that we all need to do from a manufacturing standpoint to help landscapers understand that not every time you have to have it on, on turbo or the, the highest potential power like they do with gas. Um, there is, from a Crest standpoint, we'll be launching in the next six months a backpack blower that reaches 35 newtons. But as you use it on 35 newtons, as, as I think Thomas said, runtime lowers. So it requires batter, more batteries. 
Now we can address the batteries by having a different charging system to charge the batteries faster to get longer length, those types of things. So I would just be on the lookout. There's 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 product and solutions from uh, charging that are on the way that will hopefully start to help address some of the concerns that everybody's has right now from switching from gas to cordless. Um, and then Todd and Tess and for the screen that you have up as far as the voucher amounts, one of the easiest things to do is for the voucher amount for each of the products, just put up to $300 per product, per item. Um, the batteries and chargers will have to continue, I think, to be a conversation because as new technology comes out, those retails are going to go higher, right? New technology typically doesn't launch at a lower retail. Um, but for the batteries and chargers now, the up to 1,000, maybe in parentheses, is, you know, total, right? Or total purchase. Just something to, to simplify it in that chart to make it a little bit easier. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Great comments. Thank you. And we have, um, oops, let me... We've got one more, uh, Brandon Glover. Brandon? All right, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, yes I'm clear. Thank you. Uh, this is Brandon Glover again from Still. I just want to be on the record that we do not uh, tolerate anything like that. We, we were responsible about uh, disposing batteries. We actually work with RBRC, the call to recycle. Um, on the back of our batteries actually has that on there and where you can actually call and see what um, uh, places there are uh, that you can get it uh, properly disposed. And so we've been working with them since 2010, so for a long time now. Um, and so if, if whoever that gentleman was a caller, if you can, please get with Todd Sterling, um, get his email, and then uh, Todd has my contact that he can get back to you. I, I'd like to talk to you about that because we don't tolerate anything like that at Still. Still's been very responsible, even with our gas equipment to a battery. And so I just want to be on the record to let you know that we're, it's, we're not about throwing batteries away. We want everything responsible. I'm a, I lived in California for a long time. And I think it's very important that, you know, especially as we, we go into this new um, era with battery that we're, we're being responsible. And so I know still is very um, responsible when they come to those things. And the last item that I had was is on the batteries and chargers. I would, I would suggest if you can look at it again, I mean, when you're looking at a thousand up to a thousand dollars, um, you're, you could have, you know, a lo lot of units, but not a lot of batteries. And so I, I, I would suggest maybe on the cartridge battery, uh, increasing that and also on the backpack. I know that there's different types of chargers, but most people are going to use like a standard charger or a fast charger. So if you could take the money out of there, that probably would help. And, and, and at least, you know, up the backpack and, and the cartridge batteries. I think uh, there's a lot of people that are going to be able to get through the day. They're going to, depending on what they're using, they're going to need extra batteries. So that was just my suggestion there. So thank you for the time. That's great, Brandon. If maybe we can meet up uh, next week or two and we can, we can talk about them in more detail. So appreciate All right, that. thank you. Yeah. All right, Matt, I'm going to turn it back over to you, sir, and uh, let you handle the uh, remaining questions that have uh, showed up. All right. The next question is, can program participants apply for vouchers solely to replace existing batteries for electric equipment? or augment their battery supply? So that's a great question, Sandra. So, so right now we're asking that um, if you buy, buy, get a battery, you, that it goes along with a piece of equipment. So uh, not just to buy batteries to augment the, the electric equipment you have, but we wanna get more electric equipment out there in California. So if you buy a edger, we um, hope that you buy a battery that goes, goes with that edger. Right, next question is, are voucher payments considered to be taxable income at the state and federal level? Well, this would be, a, does, does somebody else wanna jump in on this one? Um, I would think it's just a, a regular payment. So there's, there's obviously there's regular sales so, tax involved. Yeah, we don't, we, if you're asking specifically if we issue a 1099 for vouchers that are received to the purchaser, no, we do not. Uh, I don't believe so. Yeah. 
it might vary by program depending on what the eligible costs are, but I would say specifically for core, we do not. It's not income. And, and Tess, just building on that a little bit is, you know, when the, the payment is actually made for the voucher amount, that payment's going directly to the dealers. Um, the, the purchaser is, you know, paying the uh, cost of the equipment minus the voucher amount, but that payment after it's all said and done of the actual voucher dollars is, is going to the dealers and not, not individual purchasers. Yeah. Thank you for the help on that question. Next question is, if a local dealer can't get eligible equipment to sell, but can advise a customer what equipment they do need, why can't the customer go online to find what they need from a distant participating dealer? And I think this was related to an earlier exchange regarding would online sales be allowed versus an in-person requirement? No, I think we also, don't we require when the manufacturers apply as well? I mean, the 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 part that we're concerned about is the maintenance and care of the of the unit as it's move, as it's being used, and so I think we actually do require the um, uh, manufacturers to be able to like either uh, locally or within a certain amount of days get a piece of equipment um, fixed and returned. Yeah, I think for this example that we've we've heard a couple of times throughout today's work group, um, it's good for good feedback from stakeholders, so we appreciate it. But I think we need to learn a little bit more details on what that may look like. Yeah. Um, we we want to ensure, like Tess was referring to, that there's a there's a local representative that can help stakeholders, you know, pick out the equipment that's going to do the kind of work that they need to do on a daily basis, um, and then also have that serviceability. Um, to ensure that if something were to happen to the equipment, they could walk into a dealer um, and, you know, get that equipment serviced or sent to a manufacturer um, service center to, to be repaired in a timely manner. Because we all, I think we all can um, understand that every day a piece of equipment is down, that's, that's, that's work not being conducted by, by that landscaper. So we want to ensure that there's some serviceability component as well. So, but we'd love to hear more about, um, the example we keep hearing about this online kind of purchase um, and how, how that could or couldn't, you know, work in the program. Next comment is there's not enough money for batteries since you can buy 20 to 30 units on the program for under $25,000 and you only get four cartridge batteries and only two backpack batteries, which is not enough power for all the units you're getting. That's that's a good point because uh, we, we uh, that twenty five thousand dollars would be a you know riding lawn mower and a you know walk behind mower which are pretty expensive items. Um, maybe we can look at this in, in a different way or or separate out the table in a different way to uh, for folks that don't need a walk behind mower or or ride on mower uh, to get the equipment that, that they need and and uh, may reduce the amount per purchaser uh, by 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 the kind of equipment that they purchase. Something to think about. Thank you. We have another another commenter pointing out the call to recycle.org program for recycling of batteries. Uh, another commenter uh, saying they feel like we landscapers are being sent to war without weapons. Uh, next commenter, what is the time frame for CORE to pay the dealer for the voucher? That would be you, Jacob. Yeah, so generally it's um, pretty quick. Um, in our heavy duty program, we've had a lot of success. We've issued quite a few vouchers. Um, and keep in mind, th those vouchers are at much higher dollar amounts, some of them, you know, half a million for, for the larger pieces of equipment. Um, but typically, once we receive uh, a, a fully complete, what we call um, redemption form, so that's kind of the, the tail end of the voucher process, um, it's about um, seven business days, I think, is what we're, we're committing to. So it's pretty quick, and we'll work with our, with our dealers to you know, ensure that um, you know, payment is made in an expedited fashion. So. And our... Final 
question we received here is, my gardener currently uses two gas-powered mowers, two gas-powered leaf blowers, two gas-powered weed whackers. On his behalf, can you give me an estimate of how much he will have to invest to change from gas to electric? That would be before applying any vouchers. Well, I mean, that's, that's, that's a good question. Um, if you look at our table, that's the up to amount we're looking at. Um, that may or may not be the max prices. It's hard to put a exact dollar amount on it, uh, what, what you're looking at here. But um, you can look at, if you just use the up to dollar, dollar amount, add that up uh, with some extra batteries, it's um, not an insignificant amount of funds. Mm. Mm. But um, what happened here? Can you all hear me? Yes, yes, we can okay. hear you talk. It's not an insignificant amount of funds, but um, this program here is to help offset the, the cost of group from going from gas powered to, to zero emission. Yeah, we've received a lot of different comments today from ends of the spectrum, and that's why we're trying to kind of develop a program that meets the mark, but uh, that we can get the equipment out there and deploy to folks. And, and it's really tough to be able to do that with that and giving everybody the flexibility of their own individual business operations, because we're not going to dictate which ones, which manufacturer they use or which, um, which purchase they need to make. So we're, that's why a lot of their, the, all this flexibility also might, we need to be very, uh, to write the table a little bit more clearly so that, that that people can take that into consideration. Once the website is up too, I think it'll be easier to look at the various equipment types um, that are eligible for vouchers in that space once manufacturers and dealerships apply. So. The next question is part comment. It says, don't reduce amount you can purchase, just say $20,000 in total sales. And then a question, what are you doing to prevent someone from getting tools and selling them at flea markets? Well, we're hoping that doesn't happen. Um, you know, hopefully that that uh, folks folks purchase this equipment through the program, work with a dealer, and uh, go out and use this equipment in in, in California and 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 build on on that. Um, as you know, this this program may or may not know this program is building on the regulation that California passed. Uh, the Air Board passed a, a few months ago, uh, banning the sale of, of you know, gas-powered lawn and garden equipment and other SOAR, SOAR equipment, small off-road engines. Um, so hopefully they're looking at that. This program can help them um, get into the space they need to get into uh, where they have zero emission equipment, um, not only for the, the people that they're working for, but for um, the people that work for them, right? So, so this equipment would is normally operated you know, really close to uh, people in, in their hand and on their back. So if we can get rid of this um, gas powered equipment, um, reduce health risk, um, not only for uh, operators, but but the people that live here in California. So hopefully they can see that and and, and, and use this equipment as, as it should. And our, currently our, our last written Q&A says to comment on Tessa's answer, I'm pretty sure if a piece of steel equipment needs warranty service, the customer is not required to go to the selling dealer for service. You know, we're hoping that there's actually a working relationship with the dealers that you know people, um, especially for commercialized pieces of equipment that need that kind of the, the care and access. That's what we're trying to go for, for the manufacturers and being local dealers. but. You're absolutely right. There's no mandate that they have to see that specific dealership where they bought it, but there's a reason they went there in the first place. That's what we're hoping to be a part of. And this concludes the current received q and I have two raised hands, so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, unmute uh, uh, Gretchen again. I think that's Christian, right? Gretchen might be the, the name on the account. Account, correct. Is, is that right? Try that one more time. 
Okay, I'm unmuted again, Christian. There you go. Super. Super. There you go. Now we can hear you, Christian. Okay, perfect. Uh, so I think that a lot of uh, uh, people are not going to be buying the right on mowers. Uh, it, we, we do a lot of homeowners. So I think if we don't buy a right on mower, I think that amount of money should go towards uh, possible uh, purchases of your other items. And uh, the other the other thing is, is, I believe it's just it's so important to be able to prove. And uh, one of your questions before was how to stop the resale at flea markets or Craigslist is you must prove that you're a legitimate business in California. I just think it's so important. But that is uh, that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Good points. And last comment will be Ron. Uh, Ron, oh, let me see. There you go, that. There you go, Ron. Just had a quick comment about the person who asked about someone that buys wants to buy two blowers, two weed whackers, and two mowers. Uh, if they could do stacking, they could get that whole thing for free, and they'd turn in their gas equipment. It's a great point, Ron. Yeah. We talked about stacking earlier, and it kind of, kind of forgot about that so that is a great point maybe explain for the callers what that we mean by stacking and, and yeah so if you weren't here for that part so stacking would be um using core funds to purchase your equipment right up 70 percent of the msrp and then that difference up to 100 percent of the cost of the equipment could be covered by other uh either local programs or something like the carl moore program or state reserve funds um, there's a couple of different programs out there um, those funds do require, um, oftentimes they do require scrappage. So what scrappage is, is if you say you, you, you purchase a edger, um, you have to turn in an old gas powered edger to get a new zero, zero emission piece of equipment. That's not a requirement of this program, but a requirement of other uh, programs you stack with to get up to 100% of the cost of the equipment. All right, and uh, Christian's back up. Uh, can you include something on your website about stacking? Yeah, I don't, I don't see why not. If we, if we don't have that on there ready, we can do that. Yep, that would be great. Thank you. Super. Yeah, I think yeah. that once we get more information on which districts have programs, we certainly can provide uh, information on the CaliforniaCore.org website to that effect. Thank you. And we, and we currently do um, have a section in the attachment um, that uh discusses stacking and also provides uh information um to um uh carbs webpage of districts that participate in um other you know uh moyer moyer like programs and so there will be that information in the attachment d as well if, it's, if you have specific questions you can always email me i'll try to get in touch with the right folks in the district And then back to your other question that you had originally that you asked right before this one, Christian, that that's it's not on this slide, but there is a 25,000 purchaser, um, lack of a better term, cap uh, for, for voucher amounts. And so, yes, if you did not buy, if you don't buy a writing mower, you can use that, those transactions, those vouchers for other transactions of other pieces of equipment that are eligible. And that's all the questions I have. Uh, I have no more uh, hands raised and I see no more questions in the Q&A. Good meeting. Thank you everybody for your participation. I don't know, Todd, if you wanna say anything else, but I- No, I, I, no nothing else. Um, thank you everybody for your participation. Um, if you, uh, Eli, if you wanna go to that last slide so we yes. show my, my contact information one more time. Um, we've talked about a lot of different topics here today. Yeah. And a lot of a lot of different things, and some some really good points that that uh, are making me really think. So, really appreciate everybody's comments and questions, and your participation in this meeting. I know it's um, late for some folks, but um, for some folks, it's a, it's a great time. So, uh, we'll be ha it's, uh, uh, also if you if you're interested in receiving a listserv, uh, reach out to me. And I'll help you do that, and then you get listservs on different um, this not only this program but other covered programs if you're interested. And uh, if you have any other questions or comments, uh, send me an email. I'd be more than happy to help you out. Thank you very, very much.
thank you, thank you everybody very much for your help today. I really appreciate it.